Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Now, our mission is quite simple. Shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that we call home. And joining us for today's episode is Zora Township Deputy Mayor Katie Gregg. The Township of Zora is a rural municipality within Oxford County, Ontario. Zora offers many services, programs, activities, and facilities for you to live and play in the beautiful community. From animal services to the roadways, the township provides the tools and supports for members of the community to stay safe and healthy. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Deputy Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It is a pleasure to finally have you on the show after so many people telling me I need to get you on the show. So I'm glad you're able to take an hour out of your day and sit down with me and talk about yourself and your duty to serve. And that is where we're going to start, if you don't mind, Katie. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Um, I I appreciate that uh a lot of my colleagues from around the province have um, have already participated in in one of your interviews, and that they've uh, that they've mentioned me. It's been really cool, um, especially in this term, connecting with women from across the province. Um, uh, so I come from one of those families where um, I grew up with my parents helping out. Um, so. They were not politically involved, but they very much um, identified areas that they could pitch in and help. And so they did um, coaching our sports teams as kids, helping out on parent council, that kind of stuff. So it was very normalized for me um, to help out if and when and where you could. Um, and I grew up in London, so I'm from a bit of a bigger city, but moved to Thamesford. Uh, with my one-year-old and my husband at the time and just did what it was that I knew, which was try to get involved. So through those experiences of getting involved, I got to know people in the community, but I also got to know the community itself um, and really start forming some uh, connections with this place that we call, that we started to call home. Um and some of those experiences, I think, are what eventually led to me feeling the pull to to run for council. Um, my was it easy? daughter, was it easy pull. Was it an easy pull to get you to run for council? Because no, correct me if I'm wrong here, because if I'm not mistaken, and this could be getting into a, a bigger can of worms than I probably think it should be. But 2018, you run under Katie Davies. And then you yes. get married and then you change your name or you were married and you change your name in 2022, you run under Katie Gray, correct? Am I right there? So I ran as Ta Katie Davies. That was my, I was already separated. That was my married name, but it was the name that uh, my children had. And so I kept that married name, but I was already separated. Um, and then when I, uh, for the next election, when I went to run again, um, I had gone back to my maiden name. So Grig is my maiden name. Okay. Davies was my former name. And that was a challenge too, because, you know, name recognition is a big thing, but in small com communities, I changed my name mid point of the term. So it kind of gave people an opportunity to digest that change and understand that Grig meant the same person um, as Davies in terms of what I was doing out in the community. But 
Yeah. So in, in your original uh, statement about the desire, the, the duty to serve, you said there was a pull to municipal politics. What was it? Because I, I listened to an interview you gave with uh, Kate Leatherbarrow, counselor from, uh, I'm going to get this wrong right now, Woodstock, and then yep. uh, Deputy Mayor Ingersoll from Lindsay Wilson. And they talked yeah. about uh, some somewhat of a school program of arts. An arts school program is where you really got the desire in 2018, 2017 to finally put your name on the ballot. What was it about that time that you were going through? You said, okay. Now it's Katie's turn. Now it's Katie's turn to put my name on the ballot. Well, I um, I didn't think that I would get involved like this until I was like retired um, because the structure of it really appeals to a retirement lifestyle, especially in communities like these where, you know, we're in a two-tier municipality. Um, so the responsibility is in narrower scope and, and the pay reflects that. And so it's, you know, it's, it's not any kind of um, meaningful income. Um, and what I had seen reflected on my council really was um, mostly retired community members who were looking to give back. Um, my background is in fine art, so my post-secondary education is is art school, and that sort of creative um, uh, problem solving I think lends itself well to politics, even though on the surface they seem like two polar opposites. Um, but my I think my pull around the time leading into 2018, um, my daughter's elementary school uh, went through the process and was closed. Um, so in that process, um, it was a Catholic elementary school in, in the village that also had a public elementary. And at the time I co-chaired the parent council and I was um, appointed as the volunteer or the parent rep on that art committee. And so we had uh, representatives from different sectors appointed to the committee to review um, the the school closure, and um, and so our local councillor at the time, Marie Kesey, she also sat on that that committee, and she was um, she was confident, she was uh, comfortable with herself, she pushed back, and she you know I I went into that process very emotional. Um, and once I learned that the process was set up for the school to really be closed, uh, I felt so defeated. Um, but watching her, I remember saying to her, like, when I grow up, I want to be you. And, and she said to me in that moment, like, you can be me right now. Like, you don't need to wait for later. Like, you have something to contribute right now. You don't, you don't wait for this. Um, and then in the same community, the public school system was going through a similar process in an overlapping boundary as ours. Uh, Introduce Marcus Ryan. So I was about to I was about done. to interject and say, if you want good municipal leaders in Zora, just close down a school. You'll get an abundance of them. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So Mark, their process was about six months behind ours. He wasn't on the committee side. He was on the public side and he was leading the charge on that fight. And I think, you know, by the time we learned from their process, it was too late for us. And, and the specifics around uh, the two the two school reviews were different. Um, but what I learned from him is you know, the right and the wrong isn't what you lead with. Like, where can you get movement on this? How can you understand um, what motivates the school board? What are the pressures from the ministry? What are the funding formulas? Like having that kind of understanding of an issue and then curating your approach so that you can be effective is really the way to go where, you know, we can bring in the kids and they can cry and sing and ask for the school to stay open and it feels like movement. It feels like, you know, our best efforts. But at the end of the day, it, it wasn't effective. Um, so it was emotional to see that small school be saved for their community, especially since I knew what it felt like to lose your small school. Um, but that really sparked something in me where I understood, you know, you really can make a difference. Um, you really can get involved and change the way things uh, happen. Um, and it's really sort of looking at an issue and digging down deeper to try to understand 
um, more where, where the levers are, what you can push and pull to get things done. Um, Marcus then ran for council the following term. Um, and so, you know, as I interacted with the municipality over a bunch of different community issues, um, I, I got to engage with him a bit and I was, uh, I was the president of a, of a local, um, long weekend festival for some time. And through those experiences, he also recognized, you know, I'm a person out in the community doing things. So he started nudging me to run. Um, other people in the community started nudging me to run. And um, it probably took a good, you know, 20 nudges before I started considering that my time could be now. Um, can, I, can I ask a stupid question? And I feel like this is going to be the most stupidest question I've ever asked on this show. But that's what the great thing about being a host. It's my show and I can ask the stupid questions. Um, your background, your story there would be perfect for school board trustee. Someone who's passionate about what their kids are doing in their schools. But in 2018, after 20 nudges, as you say, you decide municipal is where I want to actually make a difference. Did you ever think of another level of government or was it always municipal when those nudges started to come down the sort of pipeline? It was always municipal. Um, so our our existing elected representative was not going to be running again. So there were a lot of people in the community who had concern around who's going to run. Um, so I think that was the specific role that was put on my radar. I think I also had a better understanding of what, I say I have a better understanding of what the role was. I still had no idea what the role was, but I think um, school board trustees, I think the general public has even less of an understanding of what they do. Um, and so it wasn't something that um, I had considered. And we also had a couple of trustees who had been um, elected for many years. Um, so there wasn't, you know, that we're continuing to run. So there wasn't sort of that opportunity um, where with municipal government, like a lot of my background and what motivated me was that, that experience with uh, the school closure. Um, but through my festival organizing, I had a lot of interactions with uh, the municipality, applying for permits, renting facilities, that kind of thing. Um, but the other thing is like, I, I moved to this village, uh, we were, I was a stay at home mom for eight years. Um, my husband at the time worked, we had one vehicle. So I was sort of stranded in this small town. Um, so I am uh, a walker of these sidewalks. Um, I'm a bit of a jogger. Um, so, you know, my kids learned how to ride their bikes here. We go to the parks, we use the library. So, I very much engage with um, those municipal service on a on a day to day basis. So I'm equally as passionate, I think, about a lot of the details that sometimes gets me a little bit in the weeds um, as I am sort of those overarching issues that uh, that have a significant impact on the community. Um, and I think working in both of those spaces best utilizes the skill set that I have uh, to benefit my community. So now we're all, we're coming up to six years in office. So 2018, you're elected. We're in 2024. We're recording this at the beginning of September. October is when traditionally elections are. Looking back on the last six years in office, you talked about how you really weren't, I don't say knowledgeable, but you weren't tuned into what was, uh, how the process worked in your statement. Is it what you expected? Looking back on it and going, I wish I would have known this a little bit beforehand to make my transition into public life a little bit easier. Or has it been sort of rewarding to learn as you go along and become the counselor you are today and deputy mayor you are today because you didn't have that knowledge and you're learning these responsibilities as the community is growing because I was just in Zora Township earlier this summer and it seems like a beautiful community. And I'm assuming it doesn't just get like that overnight. It takes time and effort and you're growing as a counselor, deputy mayor, as the community is growing. Yeah. So I didn't know um, all of the structure around how this work is done. 
but I did know my community. And I think when we talk about like what this work can be, um, I, I have relationships with politicians from around the province and their experiences are very different than mine. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, with your staff, uh, with your colleagues and with your community. So the things I didn't know um, about how municipal government works, um, it has been, um, I think an asset to me because I ask a lot of questions and I start from a place of assuming I don't know. Um, so it's allowed for me to be really effective um, and you know, best leveraging the resources that we have in in the quality staff that we do have. Um, you know, would would I have run if I knew how I was going to be faced with the community? I was already out in the community. I already had, um, you know, it's uh, Calithumpian is the name of the festival that that we have. It's a May two four long weekend. Uh, four day adventure. It's a hundred plus years running. Every year it's slightly different. So if I told you what it was, you know, it, it's been different in the past. It'll be different in the future, but it's really just a celebration of community. And through that experience, I already got to know, you know, the range in personalities and and people coming out of their homes to thank you for providing them opportunities to um, to get together and celebrate together. I already know, you know, what frustrations can look like, what pushback can look but like. Um, so, so can I we don't talk about that for a second? We sure. talk about the frustration, the challenges, because six years, I've asked this to many people, and I guarantee you're the same way. You've come to realize that the decisions you make around that council table are not universally accepted. No matter what you do, no matter how you vote, there's always going to be people who just do not agree with you or how the community is moving forward. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individuals and ensure that the people who disagree with you are heard? Because you talk about the school closure and how you wish you would have been able to do that a little bit differently and be able to hopefully save that school from closing. Do you look at your experience with those sort of advocacy work around that school and apply it to day-to-day -day use around the council table and say, if you come to me with a solution, I'll hear it out? Or how do you make sure your community understands the decisions you make? So this maybe doesn't tie back to maybe my learnings or um, different approach from, from the school, but um, the the role of an elected official as a representative of the community. Um, I hear a lot of people say to me, like, you represent me, and this is what I want. So this is what you have to bring forward. Um, and, you know, obviously, that's impossible, because I don't represent an individual, I represent a community. And and we have wide range in, in what we think we want. Um, hearing from individuals is very important. Um, because it helps me be better understand uh, what we think we want for ourselves. But the responsibility that I have in my role is to then take that and try to gain a deeper understanding of the issue and the broader picture where, you know, if you implement change over here, how does it impact over here? Um, and at the end of the day, sometimes the work that I push forward is the opposite of what I've been asked to do by residents. But that is what I will choose to do if I believe it's what that resident would want if they had um, the tools that I have access to to understand that issue from a deeper level. So, you is know, a, a big thing. Um, it's a muscle. It's... um. It's a skill set that you constantly have to work at. Um, but as time goes on, I find, you know, sometimes someone can hit you with some sharp words, um, make some accusations, and I'm finding that it stings less as I go forward. Uh, I'm fortunate that I don't have that happen on a on a regular basis, but uh, it's mostly online. Um, sometimes it's in the inbox where there's not an audience for it, but it, it's still, you know, um, but a lot of the parts that sting, they're coming from frustrations and hurt that residents are feeling. And, um, 
you know, a lot of it is misdirected. And if I can understand that I'm able to sort of, you know, process it and, and put it in a space where, um, I don't let it hurt my feelings too much. I don't want to thick skin. I, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate. I, I feel everything deeply and that's important for me. And I, and I think that's the value in, in how I approach this work is very authentically with, you know, through a human skin. Um, but I am able to make peace with, you know, you're hurting, you're frustrated, you're scared, you have fears. Um, it's my job to understand the facts around the circumstances and then advocate for our community um, with that knowledge. And you don't know, at the end of the day, there's often like a, you know, and it, and it all worked out. So I feel good knowing that you don't always then have someone coming back to you and saying, you know, I was really worried about this. I really thought we had to go in that direction. We went in a different direction, but it all turned out okay. You don't really get to have those conversations with residents, but that's where these relationships with other politicians and my colleagues have been so important is that, you know, we can sit back and look at the progress we're making um, and and feel good enough about the work that we can continue getting up and doing it. You... As I said at the beginning of the interview, you came highly recommended by many people around this around the province of Ontario to sit down and talk. Do you get support from other municipal leaders when you have those tough decisions you have to make? Because Marcus Ryan is a wonderful warden. Marcus Ryan, Mayor Marcus Ryan, is a wonderful guy. He seems like he wants the best for his community. Are you able to pick up the phone and say, Marcus, I have an issue. I need to talk you through this because I need a sounding board because I know you have other female politicians around the province as well that you can do that too, because I know there's this unofficial official group chat that I'd be privy to. <laughs> so yeah. do you get, does it get easier when you find sort of like-minded people who are able to identify with some of the issues and challenges that you have to go through? So you're not so lonely because a municipal politician's job can be lonely sometimes. And that was absolutely, yes. So, and that was the <laughs> challenge during the pandemic, like any elected official that was, that came in and had, you know, high, con highly controversial issues um, and spent half of their term on a zoom meeting and not being able to make those relationships like I don't know how you know I think we lost a lot of them for that very reason um Marcus has been um you know uh he has been an incredible mentor for me uh we don't necessarily use that word formally but that is functionally who he has been so I guess I should also add um you know I'm I'm just here doing my work for my community because I love it. Um, it's about the work and the community, not about me. But sometimes it is important to pause and talk about what my experience has been because it is good to reflect that outwards to others. But um, when I when I was considering running in 2018, I had uh, I was itching for some change in my life, and I was considering three things: um, going back to school and getting my master's in art therapy, or running for council, or growing my family. So um, there was those three sort of options on the table. And um, and so then when I found out I was expecting, then those other two options, I, I pushed off the table and I was excited to be expecting a baby. And uh, both Marcus and other people in the community said, well, congratulations, that's really exciting. So are you, you know, but are you still going to run? because those conversations had already started. And I was like, well, there's, you know, like, of course not, that's ridiculous. And um, okay, but why is it ridiculous? And so just kept that conversation going. So uh, small rural, rural municipalities or township is under 9,000 population. Um, I came into an all male council. Uh, Marcus was the youngest one and he's a decade or so older than I am. Um, so, you know, they, they, Put a change table in the in the washroom and uh and and accommodations were made and i actually gave birth between election and inauguration um i had a two-week-old baby at my first council meeting um he attended meetings um every meeting for the first six or seven months and then from there out he still sometimes would come i'd breastfeed him in council chambers um you know, get my work done. There was no distraction. I would bring a, a childcare provider that could take him out into a different space in the building if he was uh, noisy, but 
you know, he sat in a bouncy seat at my feet um, for for my first meeting. Um, and and that all worked. It, does he have it does he have does he have the political bug today? Does he know that oh my mom gosh. is deputy mayor? <laughs> he so he's in grade one. He's he's almost well, he's almost six years old now. He he likes to clear all the leaf debris that accumulates in the stormwater drain um and down the um down the curbs. And he's a drainage engineer in his head. He's clearing it all out. And he got his dad's a musician. And we got him a, a karaoke microphone for Christmas a couple years ago. And we're like, oh my gosh, just like your dad, like you're gonna be a musician like your dad. And he uses the karaoke microphone to conduct council meetings. <laughs> so he has had, I have always taken him to the office. Um, outside of meetings, I'd bring him in so that I could work. And I would be talking to Marcus about an issue and I'd be bouncing the baby and we'd be talking about whatever the issue was. And then Marcus would just, you know, he was, he was a stay at home dad um, leading into the council. So he would just sort of take the baby and he would, you know, do this so that we could continue talking. And he really helped share that load. So um, he was very supportive in helping me get there supportive in, um, you know, especially in those early months of me learning the steep learning curve, but then also having, you know, those changes in my personal life. Um, and then has been a sounding board for me all the way through. Um, he prefaced the beginning of that working relationship with, um, you know, I'm going to tell you what I think, but I have no expectation that you're going to agree. Do not ever feel pressure. And so, you know, quickly we were able to drop that. We're now when we call, we make use of every second where it's like, okay, so this issue, you know, like this, 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 did you read about this? Did you hear about this? Okay. Back forth, back forth, gone. Um, and it I'm meant gonna, so I'm much. I'm going to interject for a second. I, I, okay. FYI, I know we should be on to segment two right now, but I find this conversation fascinating. <laughs> Sorry. No, because I think this is an important question I need to ask because last year there was a rise in social media and online news, uh, reports from i believe it was the yukon don't quote me on the exact uh, pro territory here but uh, a female counselor gave birth to a child and there was concerns that the child would distract from inside the council table and people from social media which we all know social media is not something you should rely on but it's there as a tool people on social media say the woman shouldn't be there if she wanted to have a kid she should just go away you did it you had a kid and you were counselor literally two weeks later. What advice would you give to that mother, to that person who's thinking, I'm going to potentially give birth here, but I don't know if I can be a counselor, a mayor, a deputy mayor, a warden, as well as be a mom. You did it. What advice would you give to that next generation? Because elections are two years away in Ontario. So I'm always mindful of um, of sh of the encouragement that I give to others because I think it's important to to acknowledge the amount of support I have. So I have a lot of support at home. I have a partner who is incredibly supportive of the work that I do um, in the community, um, who is a hands-on parent um, uh, who supports me in all of this. So if I didn't have you know, the neighbors and family and partner around me that I do, I could not do this. Um, I have the support of, um, of the mayor. Um, he has approached this and set the tone for what the conversations are around having a baby in council chambers. You know, he said, well, we, you know, we've got a procedural bylaw, the municipal act sets out what, how we conduct business. So, you know, whether it's, a baby or an adult, if there's distraction, there's distraction. So, you know, if it becomes an issue, then, then we'll deal with it. Um, but that was my responsibility. This, I mean, we all have a responsibility to conduct ourselves appropriately in these roles. And I would suggest that across the province, the stories I've heard, it, you know, my child is not the one who um, we need to be concerned about. We would never say we can't let certain people get elected because they're not going to conduct themselves professionally and yet they do right so um it having that 
support, um, having staff. Uh, we have a, a CAO who's retiring in another month, um, but just having that depth of wisdom and experience from a CAO, um, the staff structure is, is so good um, that, you know, flexibility is really fostered in our, in our workforce in Zora. So it was just, it just was easy. I know that that's not the reality in a lot of places. I know that's not everybody's personal relationships. Um, but I will say this, um, the experience, the, the way that I've been able to give to my community because of my lived experience being unique in relation to theirs has been instrumental in me making significant changes. Now, not me making significant changes, I'm one of five, but me bringing a voice to the table that has changed, that has triggered the change that got um, at least three of us to put our hands up to support moving the community forward in, in a way that we otherwise would have missed. Um, not just from having a baby, um, but also raising young teenage daughters. It has absolutely influenced the work that I've done. So, you know, we just um, recently opened a, a new municipal office. We started working yeah. out of a new office, which is a whole story uh, on itself, how that came to be. Um, and I'm not sure what you talked to to Marcus about. I don't know that I, I think that was a different sort of direction, but that was a whole cool redevelopment thing that we got involved in. But we well, ended up- I, um, I made sure I stopped by it when I was in Tim's for- uh, Did you? Days. Yes, and I, I spoke to some construction workers who were, I'm not sure if it, it, it looks like it's an outdoor shake shack, it's a hot dog shack. There's something, there's like a little facility right across the road from it because- It's the, like an immobile food truck. It's like yes. a stationary food truck. It's uh, fresh or, oh shoot, Good Eats, something, but it's it, a fry truck. And But there were some people there eat? and I guess- I didn't eat anything because my husband and I oh. were driving around and I asked some of the people and I said, Oh, what's that building? Oh, oh, it's the new city hall. Isn't it good? It's like, okay, someone's excited. <laughs> so it was that, um, I'm jumping back and forth. Sorry. Are you, this, you are you this, happy this, enough with this, the... this is perfect. I love this conversation okay. already. Feels <laughs> okay. like we're old friends so there, Katie. So in behind the office is 120 acres of development that is still in the planning process, but is just about to come to council and it's super exciting, but it was a farm. It was a turkey farm that um, historically, it was really the reason that this village grew. The village grew around this farm and the farm was the main employer. So it turned into this big turkey processing plan. It was Cold Springs. It was Harvey Beatty built it. Harvey Beatty has been um, gone now for years, but is really foundational. He's on our street signs and uh, we've got the Beatty room is one of our halls. Um, so the village really grew around this farm. Well, then over time it sold to Maple Leaf. Uh, the needs of Maple Leaf changed. They weren't re retrofitting, retrofitting the existing aged infrastructure. So they ended up building something entirely new, pulled out of town. And so, you know, there's obviously a huge tax revenue loss there, but also the impact on our local businesses. You know, people aren't going for lunches in town anymore. And um, it was built with significant uh, water, wastewater infrastructure capacity for the operation of the of the facility and it's within the village boundary and within the the future growth uh, anticipated future growth so what previous to me what the previous council looked at um, which is very bold for a small rural municipality um, they looked at purchasing it what would it look like to purchase it what could we do with it and it was the purchase and sale was used as a tool to help guide the direction of the development and so um, I think it was early in my first term that we actually got into the paperwork of it and um, and sold the property, purchased it. I can't remember if the purchase happened before or after I got there, um, but then we, we put it um, out for proposal and said, we will accept proposals that meet this criteria. And what we were looking for was something that would be a healthy community with some range um, we wanted some commercial development. We wanted a range in housing style. Um, and that would, you know, the commercial development, like we're very close proximity to larger cities. It's very easy to function as a bedroom community. 
Um, but we, we lose our youth and we lose our seniors because we don't have the supports in place. We don't have public transit. We don't have a grocery store. We don't have enough of the services to keep people here. And so, you know, no one likes to grow, but if you have to grow, how are you going to grow? And so the municipality said, well, we can play a role in that through the planning process where we can, you know, act in, in the intermediate and the, we weren't going to be left with any land. We weren't going to be left with any debt. There was sort of, you know, criteria that we gave staff and that's what they were able to do. Um, fortunately, just, you know, luck, um, the timeline for this also aligned with the increase in value of uh, land. So by the time, you know, we did all the environmental remediation was complete and paid for, by the time we finished with all the land swaps of the deal, we had profited over a million dollars. So we were able, so like, I mean, you you can't duplicate that. That was just what it was. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's the ability to profit some, but um, we had significant profit. And then we had some other land that was surplus that we sold. And then we had our old office. Yeah. So in the end, we were able to take those one-time revenue sources and invest them back into not only a new municipal office, but an 88 space childcare facility, which is outside of our jurisdiction, which sometimes is a challenge. You know, you don't want to do more than what your tax base is, is set for. It's it's irresponsible, or it can be irresponsible to, to take on responsibilities of other levels of government. Um, but, you know, I think that's where some of my experience of being a new mom on council, to loop back to your previous question, you know, that that child care center had full support of council. Um, uh, but I do think that my lived experience helped me understand just how important it is for access to child care so that the community can participate fully. Right. So we were able to achieve. So we've we've built the building. We're not providing the service. We're leasing to YMCA. So they're providing the service and the ongoing expense of the building is covered by that lease agreement. But we were able to invest that one time added revenue stream into building it. And it was financially feasible because the, the construction costs were so much lower because it's a co-build. We share on the inside, there's nothing that goes like everything is completely separate, but we share that wall and that roof pitch and all of that you know, even the land needed, we've, we've needed less land because we don't need those setbacks for each structure. Right. So all of the good things, all of, I mean, there's a lot more that I can talk about for that redevelopment site. Um, but, you know, what we were able to accomplish there, I think was enhanced by um, the lived experience that I have and being a little bit different than some of the other members on council. Sure. So I want to turn, because we're talking about the township of Zora, to the next segment, because I'm cautious of time as well. And before I start this line of questioning, as I always do, I'm going to say this. This is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is her opinion and her opinion alone. That being said, it may line up with what's going on at council, but again, it's her opinion. With that being said, deputy mayor. What do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the township of Zora today as of recording this interview? You already talked about some, but are those the big, big issues? Um, I think municipalities are f facing massive issues um, across the country. Um, and I think it's important for us to remain aware of those. We've, we've in the last couple of years, um, you know, we were kind of protected from a lot of, the homelessness, uh, the the addictions issues. Um, because we're such a small rural community, we were sort of protected from seeing that. Uh, but two pieces. Number one, we are starting to see it. Um, so it is something that we're having to discuss. We don't have a large direct role here in Zora in terms of response, especially in the two-tiered structure. Uh, those service deliveries are never going to be in our community. They're going to be in the larger urban centers like in Woodstock. Um, but it is important for us to understand what our, our counterparts at Oxford County are dealing with and um, our neighbors in, um, especially in Woodstock, but in, in Ingersoll and Tilsonburg as well. So 
well, those big issues do have impact on us. We don't have a lot of direct interaction or responsibility in them. So they're not the, the change or they're, they're not the, um, uh, the challenges that most communities are facing. Personally, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing is change. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, the challenge is finding ways to grow in a, um, in an, where we can be responsible, fiscally responsible for the types of choices we're making around what kind of community we want to be tomorrow. And so my background really comes from like, what has brought me to the municipal table is really, I love uh, connection in the community, that strong sense of community. Um, it enables people to step up and volunteer, to contribute. Uh, bylaw issues are more manageable when we get to know our neighbors and build relationships and want to help out with each other. Our tax pressures go down when we have a community that um, is healthy and able to actively participate. And I think growth really challenges all of that. Um, and so you know, there's a lot of resistance to change. So what does that change specifically look like? It'll be a, it'll be a, a planning application. Um, it will be, you know, we had a presentation from a, a, a wind farm company about potential wind farm coming to the area. So as much as the, the issues, the key issues right now might be wind farms, might be specific planning applications, um, my understanding of the actual biggest challenges are the challenges around how we respond to change um, well, in how, a way that is not. How do you respond to change in a sustainable way? Because I can imagine that you get present it with a lot of change overnight at every single council meeting there's probably always something that needs to be changed in the community that's what bylaws changes are for that's what planning developments for that's what wind farms are yeah. for how do you and you and you as the royal you as council you uh work towards a sustainable change that the residents will be happy with knowing as we talked about in the earlier segment not everyone's going to be happy with change so there is there is no everyone's happy at least not right out of the gate it might take some time for them to to understand what they're okay with or not i think um when new ideas come to communities um there is a certain percentage of those new ideas that can reasonably be implemented in the type of municipality that we have. A lot of people come from places that have very different um, tax revenue streams. Um, so for us, like we're we're a rural municipality. Um, so for for listeners who you know, I don't know the the level of detail you pay attention to stuff, but like when people pay their property taxes, a residential property tax, uh, uh, agriculture properties pay a, a lower percentage than commercial properties pay a higher, industrial pays higher. So when you have larger cities that have like, that's the value in all your commercial and industrial development is those are revenue streams to fund the supports, the infrastructure supports in those communities like say public transit. But because uh, we have a provincial policy statement that protects our prime agricultural resources in theory and practice, sometimes that's a little challenged, uh, you know, Greenbelt scandal. Um, but I wasn't going to say, say it. I wasn't going to say it. No, I wasn't, wasn't going to say, say it. <laughs> Um, but who we are as a community and who we are as a council, we really, um, we are, we are a rural community. We, we value, um, our farmland is some of the best farmland in the country. It is our prime economic driver. It, it is, it is our identity. Um, protecting that farmland is very important to us. Um, but it also means that there's some restrictions on, on what those tax revenue streams are. We do receive uh, uh, grant funding through the province that's meant to sort of capture what those tax deficits are that we don't get because farmland pays a lower rate. Um, but that amount has gone down over years as the cost of us operating has only gone up. So that gap is definitely there. 
So if you come from a big city and you really think indoor pools are amazing and you want to put one in, in this town, um, that's not a reasonable, sustainable change for the community. Um, where, you know, we've, if you've always lived here and you want your taxes low and you might think we don't need a pool at all, uh, we don't need anything recreation. Um, those might be some, some old mentalities that need to be challenged as well. So when I talk about finding sustainable change, it's finding, you know, how do we redefine ourselves as a community? Recreation infrastructure is an easy one to sort of talk about in terms of, you know, sustainable is, um, you know, what is it that we want to build? How are we going to fund it? And do we have an ongoing funding source that's going to allow for us to sort of meet that service level? Um, and hearing sort of the voices, how I think how we as a council look at it, but definitely how I look at it as an individual member of council is I think it's really important to understand and honor the history of Zora Township, this space, and then look at what new ideas um, can be brought in and integrated to enhance it. I think that we all stand to learn from people who have had different lived experiences and lived in different places. I love talking to counselors from different um, areas to find out what they're doing that we could borrow and, oh my gosh, that would work really great here. Um, I also think it's important that people that are moving here from somewhere else have opportunities if they're interested to learn about some of the things that make us historically who we are. Um, I had a conversation with a new resident who was sort of interested in, you know, real estate development. And, uh, and the, the comment was sort of like, there's so much space here. Like there's so much space for growth. And it's like, oh my gosh, let me tell you why I don't agree with that. Like, you know, that 120 acre redevelopment is a wonderful thing because we're going to get some good density in there because the farmland on the other side of the growth boundary grows the best crops in the province. So, you know, when, when he's looking at that field, he's seeing opportunity for real estate. And so that's where sharing some of our roots as a rural community is important that, you know, in having those conversations, you, he has the opportunity to learn some of the values of the historical community, but also we have something to learn from him. So that's the balance and sort of, you know, I'm thinking more like the funding sustainability of how we move forwards. What's the right service level for communities like ours um, that are restricted in, in what our tax levy, you know, reasonably can be. We talk about challenges a lot and every municipality, whether they be a lower tier municipality like uh, Zora or upper tier like Oxford County or a large city like the city of Toronto, they all have their challenges, but they all have things that are going right for them. And I often forget to ask the what's going right in your community question, but I want to ask it now because I was there. It is a beautiful community. It is one of the most gorgeous, and it's so nestled away, you don't even think you're going to see something beautiful until you arrive. And when you arrive and you go down the valley and you're like, holy crap, where have I just gone? Because it feels like I'm in like Stars Hollow from Gilmore Girls. That's how I felt when I was driving <laughs> through it. So for you, what is the thing that you, when you look at the challenges, they can get a, semi erased by what's going good in your community? What's the thing that you are so proud of that when you go to Amo, when you go to Roma, you just boast like there's no tomorrow? When I go to Roma and Amo, I'm boasting about the childcare facility, our flexible work day, our incredible municipal staff because of the environment <laughs> we've been able to foster, the healthy debate that we have at council because we have respectful disagreements with colleagues that you know, that we eat lunch with, you know, those are the kinds of things that I share with politicians. But I think really the the thing that we have right as a community is really the people. Um, that's the part where sort of it builds right up here for me. Like it's, you know, we have incredible people um, that uh, rally together and and look out for each other. And, um, and, I, and I'm sure that's what everyone says about, about their communities, but it, it is, absolutely true for for Zora Township 
we have, um, you know, this tiny, tiny little blip on the map called Harrington. And it's this like, it's so tiny. Like they don't, you know, there's, there's, it's so tiny. They have a grist mill and there's this group that has come together to protect and reserve the grist mill. And they've documented the history and they open it up to the community. And it's just this beautiful grounds. There's, um, there's, there's a pond, there's a trail, there's some green space. There's, you know, all the birds and, it's just this beautiful little space that you can enjoy. And the reason you can enjoy it is because the community rallied and organized and their, their ongoing work to protect what it is that they love about their little corner of Zora. And it goes, you know, down here in Thamesford, like we have the Thamesford Lions Club. There's something like there's 70 plus members um, in this club. And we're just, you know, in a, in a village of under 3000 population and they do non-stop positive for the community and they're the Thamesford Lions Club and I think you know historically it, it, that bo boundary really was where they served but there's no Thames or there's no Lions Club in different areas within Zora so they've really I've noticed in the last you know five to ten years they've really expanded that they're participating all the way across Zora Township um, and benefiting all of our communities um, we love the things that happen in in our corners of the township and so we participate there but then it's hard to have volunteers because i want to participate i don't want to help at this thing and so that's where you know the lines will go and help out in embro at something and then embro will come and help out in Thamesford. um our volunteer firefighters are just you know highly trained you know people don't realize that they have all the credentials of a full-time firefighter and they do that work in the most challenging way because they're out in their own communities, seeing their own friends and family, um, and their and their compensation is nothing. It is you know fourteen cents, um, and on they go. And I've since getting on council and realizing all of that structure, it's like I don't know how we have people continue to step up and volunteer, and it's because of the people. There's that there's that camaraderie, and we look after each other. Um, and I think that's the piece where the the responsible growth is so important to me is being able to protect those connections and um, and grow them as we grow as a community so that everything that we love about Zora um, only grows as we grow. I want to turn to my last subject, and you mentioned a bit of it already. It seems like you were prepared for this interview by listening oh, to <laughs> other. I want to talk about tourism, and I, like I said, I've been to your community. It's beautiful, but what what are the hidden gems that I missed? That if I potentially would be coming back and say, oh, I don't know, November of this year, because I have an event in uh, just uh, Niagara area. Um, what should I be coming out to Tor uh, Zora Township to see besides continuous to see the go see the grist mill because I'm a sucker for a grist mill no matter where you are. <laughs> <laughs> so our tourism is through Oxford County. So I will talk a little bit about uh, Zora specific, but we organize like tourism is through the county. And it functions so well because there's so many programs that will take you all over the county. So I think one of the things about um, um, small rural municipalities, we so much of our tourism is tied to um, to farming and farming has its own schedule, has its own ebb and flow. And our tourism industry really respects that and works with it. So you get what you get when you get it. And then when it's done, it's over. And it's actually really cool to see how our businesses really um, work with that. And that's that's who we are as a community. So, um, you know, we have uh, um, like uh, Fleming Farms. So they do like you pick berries and they do pumpkins and um, they're, they're a farm that you can come and, and get your own stuff, but it's well, it's in season when it's not in season, you don't go to the farm. So yeah. there's spaces that, uh, that come and go and change as the seasons evolve. And I think that's where, uh, Oxford tourism really comes into play where connecting with 
across the county. Uh, there's all sorts of programs and places that you can go. There's the, the Cheese Trail. Um, the Oxford County Tourism uh, website is phenomenal and there's lots of different things to do. So November specific, I'd have to go back and look to see what I would recommend for you. But the gems that are... Uh, what's, what, what's the thing that you do? What's what's the hidden gem for you? We're, we're, we're so, after a long day of council meeting, after a long day of being mom to a six-year-old and some teenagers, where do you go in the community? Just let it all go and decompress. So we have on, on our main street, uh, quintessential main street watering hole, we have brunnies. So um, brunnies is great. You can get a cold drink. They have like pub grub, but kind of elevated, like it's good food. Um, it's tiny. They've got a big patio. Um, and it's just, it's just small town, good stuff. Um, so that's, that's a great place. It's a place that you can, I, they, through the pandemic, they sort of changed a little bit what they, what they do, but I think they're back into doing Sunday brunch. We don't have a lot of places where you can go and sit down, but that's one of them. Um, so that's, that's a fun place to go to now and then. And then, uh, beside it is the village deli and they have, if you're coming through here, it's, um, I think there's like two chairs and a table. Like the dine-in is very small. It's like, take your sandwich and go kind of place. They have probably the highest like meat to topping ratio that I've ever seen in a sandwich place. If you like meat, you will like it. Um, they have something called the cowboy wrap and it is my absolute favorite and now that we have our municipal office here in Thamesford we get lunch together um so I always I know change is important change is good for us but I always get that cowboy wrap I it, I highly recommend it um if I'm leaving town if I'm leaving town there's a place in Embro called Kintor Coffee, which is kind of confusing because Kintor is another town. Kintor is where uh, the elementary school AJ Baker that the Marcus Ryan group saved, the infamous AJ Baker. Um, so that's in Kintor um, and that's where the coffee uh, business originates from is, is that's its namesake, but it's located in Embro. And it's a fantastic little community meeting space. Um, it's a coffee shop, but they also carry all sorts of local, um, you know, handmade stuff and local brand, this and that. And they've got enough space that you can go in and really, you know, chit chat with, with your friends and family. So yeah, big shout out to Kintor Coffee. Small little coffee shop, and they now are selling coffee out of I don't know how many grocery stores all over the place. They've they've really uh, cracked that coffee market. Well, maybe when I'm in back in Ontario in Niagara, we can go get a cowboy wrap and go get some Kintro coffee. Then <laughs> I would love that. Um, Absolutely. So before I let you go, I have one final question for you, and you've already answered it a little bit throughout the interview, but let's sum it up in the elevator pitch, if you don't mind. What makes Zora Township such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? It has just such a beautiful balance um, of villages and farms. It, it's it's a great space to sort of connect back to yourself. Uh, there's just a little bit more breathing space in Zora. I love cities. I love visiting cities. Um, but it's always nice to come home. Um, and I think it's, it's, um, yeah, it's it's hard for me to to pinpoint because it's something that I have grown such so so much emotional attachment to. But so I think can I, ask, can I ask the stupid question then the sort of the reversed of the original question? What made you yeah. move to Zora Township when you were deciding? Because you left London and you decide to set up shop in Zora Township. What was the draw and what was the allure? Because when you're there, it seems like it's a whole new world and it just seems so relaxful and I just didn't get that a lot when I was doing my tour 
Well, when, when I was growing up and we'd go for drives to places and we'd go through small towns, I would always, cause I grew up in London. I would say to my parents, like, what do people that live here, what do they do? And the only thing that I saw was like small rural communities. They all have trampolines. And it was like, in my mind as a kid, it was the only thing in a small town you could do was jump on a trampoline. And yes, like a lot of farming communities, trampolines are the best way to keep kids occupied. But um, when I moved here, I had a one-year-old. I was looking for, you know, where do I want to raise my child? And I grew up in a great neighborhood in London and just did not have the financial means to purchase there. Um, and so, you know, we were looking to purchase a home on a single income, which is, you can't even, that's unheard of now. Um, and my ex-husband, he grew up in a, in an area that was not as great. And so we had a really deep sense of what we liked and didn't like, but what we could afford was different. So then we just expanded our boundary out and, and thought, well, what about a small community? And it was really the affordability. It was a big backyard. Uh, we bought the first house we looked at and it was the backyard and the big tree. And the, before we even moved in, we would drive out here and park our car and get the stroller out and walk around and, and say, you know, what's here? And, you know, the little country tool shed uh, hardware store and they sell power tools like those tiny little things. It was like, oh, look what we get to have in this cool little place of nothing. And then and then I ended up spending multiple years at home full time with my two daughters and it and without no without a vehicle. And it's like, yeah, the trampolines are here, but like there's the river and you can go to the dam and you can collect rocks and you can go to the park and you can, you know, and it was really like, there's so much space. Um, it's hard to meet people in a new, when you're new to a small town, but there's so many spaces that you can start building relationships with the community and with the people that live here. And what I love about it now is I go out front and, you know, if someone drives by, they're going to put their hand up and, you know, who is that? And, that you go to the post office to get my mail at the post office and I'm going to run into someone and, you know, that sort of cheers feeling of, of uh, your home. And I think that's because that's what I love so much about here is feeling like I belong. That really guides my work on municipal council. I want everyone who lives here, whether they were born here, or moved here yesterday um, to feel like they belong here so that they can enjoy living here as much as I do. And then hopefully also contribute. Speaking of the hand, the hand wave, I got a few of those during my time in Zora, and I'm not sure if they thought it was just some other random person in a car until they saw the Alberta license plate, but I got a few of those hand waves. So yes, you do get that <laughs> in small town Zora Township. Um, yeah. Deputy Mayor, I want to thank you. This has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. I'm so glad we were able to connect. I'm so glad we were able to sit down and chat about yourself and to chat about the Township of Zora. I feel like we just scratched the surface. So when I'm back there in November, let's continue this conversation and just add a little bit more personality into it because I feel like unscripted, we could just go for hours. Oh my goodness. I think so. <laughs> Sounds good. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a true difference within their own community. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode and a great conversation with another municipal leader. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you these important conversations like you heard today. So until next time, stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you here on the Cross Border Interviews. Till then.